He's our president and founder here of Harris Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries, and I know he has some great things for Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Yes. You are a blessing. I know you guys have been having a great time. I was talking to Todd. Sounds like you had a wonderful time last night. Awesome. Man, this is exciting for me. I, for those of you that are new, I used to hate ministering to youth. And I mean, for years, it's only been about the last four or five years that I've enjoyed doing it. And it's this group right here because of the people that come here. Uh, you've changed my opinion about youth. You guys are receptive and seeking the Lord. And it has uh, really, it's, it's been a pleasure the last few years to get to share with you. Actually, at one of our summer family Bible conferences, back when uh, Carrie Pickett was running it, I came in, and we probably had about 70 or 80 youth, and there was these kids on the back row, and the boys and girls were writing notes to each other, and they were sitting there with their arms like this, and they didn't want to hear a thing. And I got up, and I told them, I said, I hate ministering to youth. I said, I hate ministering to you. And it just shocked them. And I said, it's because you don't love God. You're here to check out the guy or the girl next to you, and I just let them have it. And anyway... It turned out that there was two or three of the youth that wound up coming to Bible college just to prove me wrong. And uh, they did. And so anyway, but now I've gotten to where I'm kind of excited about it. And last year we had a great time in here and took questions for, I don't know, a long time, an hour or more. And I had a young girl. I don't know if you're here this year, but one, one of the young girls, are you here? No. Oh, awesome. I need to thank you for asking that question. What's your name? My name's Emma. Emma. Yeah. I should remember that. That was my grandmother's name, <laughs> Emma. So anyway, Emma asked a question about what would, advice would you give a teenager? And it shocked me. Like, why would a teenager want to hear from an old man? And I got to thinking about it. And anyway, I've written a little book entitled A Message to Teenagers from an Old Man. And I'm going to give one of these copies to every one of you there over here. And we'll give you uh, one uh, today. But, you know, really, there is advantage to you listening to somebody who's been where you're going. And I know that a lot of times there's a disconnect between an older person and a younger person. And a young person says, what do I want to hear what you've got to say? The world has changed so much. Like, man, I, yesterday they asked me to take a QR code, and I didn't know how to do it. I had to have my assistant do it. <laughs> Every one of you can do that, but, yeah, I just didn't know how to do that. And people think, well, what do you have to offer me? But it's similar to, like, if you go over to a foreign land or something like that, if you've never been there before, did you know you're going to have uh, things that you aren't accustomed to? And if somebody has been there before you, they could tell you what's the best way to go, places to eat, uh, you know, just tell you all kinds of things. If you're driving down a road and you're headed someplace, the people, if they're in front of you, whether you like them or not or whether you agree with them on anything, they could tell you whether the road's open, whether it's closed, if there's uh, problems up ahead. So uh, if you don't listen to somebody who's been down the road that you're headed on, then you're going to have to learn everything just through your own hard knocks. And that's not the best way to learn things. So there's a better way. So anyway, today I'm just going to offer you a little bit of advice from an old man. And if you'll listen to it, uh, I think that this could really, really help you. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and this, some of these things that I'm going to share with you may be different than the things that you've thought, but they're things that have really blessed me and have made a difference in my life. But when do you become an adult? You know, our society says, well, it's when you're 18. That's when you could be drafted. That's when you uh, can vote and do things like that. But did you know that traditionally uh, teenage years did not exist? This is only something that's happened relatively uh, recently because of the affluence that people have gotten into. Now they are able to just kind of wait until they graduate from high school and stuff. But did you know that traditionally uh, people... Uh, began to start being adults at 12 years of age. Jews at bar mitzvah, uh, they, that's when they become a man. And did you know that that's the way it was in this nation, as a matter of fact? John Quincy Adams, who was the sixth president of the United States, when he was 11 years old, he went with his father, John Adams, who was the second president of the United States, he went with his father overseas. By the time he was 13, he was fluent 
in French, and he became an ambassador to Russia at 13 years of age. He was a representative of the United States government, and he was actually a part of signing the treaty that ended the uh, American Revolution. At 13, he was doing those things. Uh, there was lots of people that graduated and graduated from college when they were 14 and 15 years old. Uh, there's a guy named Thomas A. Crapper, who <laughs> some of you might be able to guess what he did, but he's the guy that perfected the toilet. And uh, anyway, that's where that name comes from. But his name's Thomas A. Crapper, and I read his biography, and his biography was entitled Flushed with Pride, and his heart was truly in the toilet. Man, this guy, he just lived to invent a greater toilet. And so he was born in the 1800s, I think 1830-something. And did you know at 11 years of age, his parents gave him two or three shillings, which would amount to maybe $5, and gave him a sandwich, and he left home and walked 300 miles to uh, London, and he was on his own at 11 years old. That's the way it was done. And when I read that, I thought, there is no way. How could this happen? And, and it went on to say that was unusual because most children didn't become adults until they were 12 or 13. But they were out on their own, and they were having to make a living. You didn't have your parents providing for you. That's the way it was in the 1800s. And you can look in, in the Bible. Did you know David was 17, they believe, when he was anointed to be king, but he was... Uh, much younger than that, when he killed a lion and a bear with his ba bare hands, he stood up and fought wild beasts and won. And you can just go through so many, many people uh, in Scripture that they were considered to be adults uh, during what we call teenage years. The reason I think this is important to share with you is because a lot of teenagers just look at teenage years as in-between years and they're basically years for you just to goof off and just to have fun, and you, don't, you aren't serious. You know, one of the things that shaped my life was my dad died when I was 12 years old. He was actually in the hospital when I was 11, and it was just a couple of weeks after I turned 12 that my dad died. And as a result, it made me serious. It gave me a different perspective on life than most of my friends. My grandmother, who... Uh, was very instrumental in raising me. She died when I was eight. So by the time I was 12, I'd had uh, two dominant people in my life die. And because of it, on the outside, you might have thought I was just a normal kid. But when my friends were just totally silly and doing things that made no sense whatsoever, I couldn't participate. I, I never criticized them or anything like that. But in my heart, I just knew that life was more important than goofing off and doing nothing. I had experienced a lot of tragedy, and there's many of you in here that maybe you haven't had a parent die or something, but you've had divorce in your family. You've seen a lot of things happen. You kids are exposed to a lot of things that I wasn't exposed to. And you know what? You need to realize that you are not too young to start being serious and getting serious about what God's plan for your life is. And one of the things that really molded me, even when I was five and six years old, I used to lay out in the backyard at night and just look at the stars and ask God, what's my purpose? I've known that God had a purpose for me from the day one. Now, I didn't pursue it as hard as I should have. I'm not saying I did it perfectly, but I've always lived with that. And I remember when my dad died at his funeral. Uh, you know, they do things usually differently now, but back in those days, you always had the person in the casket and it was an open casket, and everybody would walk by and look at this dead person. And so I was sitting on the front row, like right here, and my dad was in a casket, and I was looking at him just four or five feet away, and they were singing his favorite song, How Great Thou Art. And I had prayed for him. I'd even fasted as an 11-year-old that my dad would be healed, and he wasn't healed, and he died. And I was really confused by this. And they, as they were singing this song, How Great Thou Art, I just remember the irony of it and thinking, God, I don't understand how great you are. I prayed, nothing happened, and uh, it really confused me. And I remember while they were singing that song and I was looking at my dad's body, I just said, Father, if you've got a purpose for my life, I want you to reveal yourself to me. 
And I mean nearly immediately God started speaking things to me. It was six years later when I had my major encounter with the Lord in 1968. But I'm convinced that it was a result of that prayer and me seeking the Lord. The Bible says if you seek, you find. If you knock, it's open to you. If you ask, you receive. And so I just want to encourage you. One of the things is that you aren't too young to start acting like an adult. You don't need to throw away these years. There's so many changes taking place in your body and you're learning how to do things totally different. And man, you need to be serious about finding out what God's purpose for your life is. And you know, I'm not going to take time right here to teach on this, but I've got a teaching entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. And I can guarantee you, you are not going to accidentally fulfill God's will for your life. You have to do it on purpose. You have to pursue it. Satan is going to throw everything at you that he can to try and keep you off track and keep you from doing what the Lord wants you to do. And so it's not going to happen accidentally. Some people are taught that God sovereignly makes everything happen. That's, that's a lie. If that was true, well, then there wouldn't be any divorce because God said he hates divorce. It wouldn't be any sickness. There wouldn't be any disease. There wouldn't be any of these things. God does not control your life. Now, he's got a perfect plan for you. But you are completely free to do your own thing. God will never force himself upon you. And so I'm just encouraging you during these teenage years, one of the first things you need to do is to get serious with God. In time past, people your age were already making a difference in the world. And you need to really be seeking the Lord and recognize that God sees you no longer as just a little kid. It's not all about having fun. It's not all about what you can do and what people can do for you. It's what you can do to help other people. So that's one of the first things that you need to do is just remember that. In um, Ecclesiastes 12.1 it says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And so this is just saying that during this period of time, you're really in one of the greatest periods of time in your entire life because you're still... At home, somebody else is earning the living for you. You are blessed and you have freedoms and uh, opportunities, time to seek the Lord that you may never have once you get fully grown and you're having to go out and work an 8, 10, 10 hour a day job and things like this. You've got an opportunity right now that you may never have again. And I'm just encouraging you to start using it to seek the Lord. And again, I've got some materials that would help you on that. Next thing I want to talk about, and this will be a surprise to some of you, but did you know that Jamie and I both, my wife, Jamie, we both decided that we were going to seek God and not seek a mate and not seek a, boy, a girlfriend or boyfriend and that we were going to let God put us together. Let me share these verses with you that the Lord showed me out of... Um, I could quote them, but I wanted to give you the reference for them. It's right here in this little book. It says, Proverbs 18, 22, Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And then put that together with Psalms 34, 10. It says, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. So you know what, I, what the Lord showed me out of this? Now, I've dated, and I actually went steady with this girl for two years. And, man, we eventually broke up, and it just broke my heart. And I felt like an absolute fool for being tied to this girl for all that time. And, man, praise God, things didn't work out. But, uh, anyway, after that happened, I just determined, I took these scriptures. God spoke these scriptures to me and said, if a wife is a good thing for you, then I'll bring her to you. You don't have to go shopping around, and you don't have to go looking. And Jamie made that exact same thing. And so did you know that my wife, Jamie, and I were, in ma were engaged to be married before we ever held hands? And boy, most people today, that's just terrible. They look at dating as a rite of passage. This is just something that you do. Did you know if you get to where you're dating, and again, I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying that there's a better way of doing things. If you get emotionally, physically involved with a boy or a girl, then you go to praying and saying, God, is this the one? Your hormones are going to be screaming so loud you can't hear the voice of God. 
you're already emotionally attached and things like that. That is, you aren't going to be objective when you do that. You know, we don't have a blackboard up here, but uh, anyway, if you could imagine an isosceles triangle, everybody understand what that is? An isosceles triangle is where the two uh, vertical parts are equal size. So if you could imagine a triangle like this, and down here is the man and down here is the woman, the way most people find their mate in life is to just go shopping around, looking, choosing, and they, they relate to each other on this uh, horizontal plane. And then if they're Christians, once they get together, if they get married, then they're going to seek the Lord. Then they want to seek the Lord. You know, what the Lord showed me is if the man would seek the Lord, God is up here at the top of the triangle, and if the woman is seeking the Lord, you will intersect. God will put you together. God brought Eve to Adam. I've already done it with my little fingers. <laughs> God brought Eve to Adam, Ruth to Boaz, Rebecca to Isaac. God is the one who said it's not good for a man to be alone. Did you know God will put you together supernaturally? And I actually reached a place. I said, God, I don't ever want to kiss any person. I'd already broken it, but I said, from now on, I don't ever want to kiss any person except the person that I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with. I want everything in me to be dedicated to her. And I tell you, this is, again, not the way that most people think. Most people think that teenage years is just time to date and to experiment, to do things, and you go and pick the girl based on how beautiful she is or the guy on how athletic he is and all those things. Did you know all of those things change? And if you're going to make your decision just based on these outward qualities and stuff, that's not going to last. I've been in ministry for a long, long time, for 56 years, and I have dealt with thousands of people who at one time they said they were just so passionate. They loved each other so much, and it wasn't love at all. It was all based on how that person looked. The guy picks the girl who's a homecoming queen, and he wants everybody to envy him, but did you know she's not going to stay like that forever? And the girl picks the guy who's an athletic guy and has got this long, wavy hair and is just so handsome and stuff. And then he loses his hair and he gets uh, Chester drawers disease. That's where your chest is done dropped down into your drawers, amen. <laughs> or you get the Dunlop disease where your belly's done lopped over your belt buckle. And all of a sudden people say, well, I fell out of love. We've lost our love. It never was God's kind of love. Love is not about what you can get from another person. The average person looks at love like, you know, having a, a drink or something. You stick a straw in it and you suck everything out. And when you hear the, at the end, they say, well, we fell out of love. You've just sucked all of the good out of them that you could get. And so now you're going to go mess up somebody else's life. There's some of you that actually have uh, been raised in a family that maybe that's the way that it went. They just were basing their relationship on nothing but physical, natural things. And I tell you, that's not going to last. True love isn't about what you can get. It's not about a feeling. It will involve feelings, but it's not a feeling. And I'm telling you, you uh, most young people today just think that this is the way it's supposed to be. You're going to go date. You're going to experiment. You're going to do things that you would later regret. I'm telling you, as an old man, I do not regret having waited and saved myself for my wife. And I can promise you, if you don't follow this direction, and I know that some of you probably won't, but if you go out and experiment, do your own thing, and you get in trouble, and if you do things physically that you should not be doing, you will wind up regretting it. It will wind up hindering you in your marriage. Now, God can set you free from all of those things, but it's so much better not to have to deal with it. You can be forgiven of anything, and you can be set free from anything. So I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's not uh, something you can get over, but, man, it's something you don't want to have to deal with. So I don't believe that God intended for us to just shop around and visit and experiment and stuff. You ought to save yourself for the one person that God has intended. I believe that God puts people together. Now, there's other examples. Man, you can take David and Bathsheba, who it was a totally adulterous relationship. And uh, that wasn't God that put them together. But nonetheless, when they repented, God blessed it. 
and uh, they, they are the ones that produced Solomon, and Solomon was called Jedediah by God, which meant beloved of God. So God can take any situation and bless it, but there's a better way, and that's just to wait on God, and I want you to know that God has picked out a person for you. There is a person that will be completely compatible. I can say that my wife, I won't tell you all the things we've been through, but we've been through some tough stuff. And we've been through things uh, that I don't think there's another woman on the planet that would have stuck with me through all the stuff I've put her through. It was terrible. And yet Jamie has never complained, never griped. God put us together. We were raised that this is the, this is the second most important decision you'll ever make in your life is who you're going to marry. The first one being your relationship with God. But outside of that, who you marry is the most important thing. You know, if I had just done something on my own and chosen a person that God wasn't the one that put us together, and if they had gotten upset over the things that we've been through, which we've been through a lot of hard stuff, and if they'd have left, and if I'd have been divorced, it could have wrecked me. I could have uh, missed everything that God had for me. So I just want to encourage you that this is really important and you do not need to be experimenting. You don't need to do things that you're going to reject, re regret. Amen? Amen? And so I just encourage you, you do not have to go out and shop around and just pick somebody. If you seek God with all of your heart, he said, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and no good thing will he withhold from them who seek him. So it's a promise that God will put you together supernaturally and you do not have to go out and make uh, all of those mistakes that so many people do. Amen? Amen. All right, here's another thing. is uh, A lot of young people in, in this book, I've got it listed, that a lot of young people just think that rebellion is a normal part of growing up and that you've got to rebel against authority, rebel against your parents, you may not state it that way, but you really do feel like that. I'm getting older, and, it's, and you know, I'm not going to be told what to do. Let me read some scriptures to you. One of them is out of 1 Samuel 15, 23, and it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Did you know in the Old Testament, if a child rebelled against their parents and was insolent, and I probably a lot less... Um, you know, uh, rebellion than what most people are accepting today. But in the Old Testament, if you cursed your parents, if you stood against them in any way, then the parents were to deal with that. And if you didn't respond to the parents, they brought you to the elders of the city, and the elders of the city tried to get you to submit. And if you didn't submit, then the elders of the city made the parents be the very first ones to take a stone and kill a child who was rebellious. That's the way it was dealt with in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, praise God, we're forgiven and we can be cleansed of things or many of us would be dead. So I'm not saying that that's the way it should be done, but it shows you how bad it was. And this verse makes it clear that it's like the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. The reason that God was so vicious with rebellion in the Old Testament was because it's demonic. When you rebel, when you get a rebellious attitude where nobody's going to tell me what to do, I'm going to run my own life. That is a demonic attitude. It literally gives place to demonic spirits. And the reason in the Old Testament that they killed them is because in the Old Testament you couldn't be born again, you couldn't be delivered. We didn't have authority over the devil. So it was like a cancer or something. You had to just cut it out. And so they dealt very severely with rebellion. But did you know, just because in the New Testament we can be forgiven and that God loves us and there's grace and He's not going to judge you, that still doesn't mean that rebellion is good. Rebellion is demonic. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. There's probably most of you who would not go out and just practice witchcraft, but every time you practice rebellion, you are doing the same thing. You are letting Satan have an inroad into your life. And I'm telling you, you can't just all of a sudden live this way during your teenage years, and then when you're out on your own, all of a sudden you just turn it off and you change, and now you aren't going to be rebellious anymore. It doesn't work that way. 
you can't give place to this stuff during your teenage years and expect it just to evaporate as you get older. And so many people I deal with, it actually goes back to when they were a kid. You know, the scripture says that if you honor your father and mother, you will live long on the line, on the earth. There's a lot of people that put the emphasis on diet and exercise, and those things are okay in their place. But did you know that the scripture says a merry heart does good like a medicine? Honoring your parents will extend your life. Exalting the word, the word will be health unto all of your flesh. I personally believe that your health and longevity in life is probably 80 or 90% spiritual and maybe 10% diet and exercise. That's the opposite the way people think. I'm telling you that this rebellion that is so prevalent, it's one of the signs of the end times. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says in the last days people will do, and it lists 19 things, and one of them is that people will be disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, liars, deceivers, people who profess that they love God but they don't love Him and it says from such turn away. And this is happening in major, major proportions in our world today. So I'm just encouraging you, don't just go by what everybody else does and, and get this attitude. You need to honor your parents. Now again, there's some parents that probably have done some things, there may be some parents that don't treat you right and stuff. I'm not saying you ever obey uh, ungodly commands, but there's a difference between obedience and submission. Submission is an attitude. Obedience is an action. You can actually disobey. If your parents were to tell you to renounce the Lord or try and lead you into witchcraft or something like that, you don't ever obey anything that's contrary to the Word, but you can do it with a submissive attitude. If you do it with the wrong attitude, then you're also wrong, even though you might be doing the right thing. Submission is an attitude, and you need to have a good attitude and submit and honor your parents. Amen? You know, my mother, my dad died when I was 12, so my mother and I became really close. My brother, he was four and a half years older than me, and he got in trouble. He got arrested by the cops. He never went to prison, but he, he was in and out of things. He would stay out all night long, and my mother, uh, she couldn't stop him, and so she would just sit there and wait up for him and cry at night, and I just determined I was never going to do that to my mother. And so as a result, uh, until I got married, I never uh, violated anything my mother told me to do. I remember as a kid, she'd tell me to be in at 10 o'clock or 10.30, I think it was back then, and uh, we didn't have cell phones, but one time I locked my keys in the car, and I couldn't uh, get in. And I had to walk a mile or so to find a pay phone. Do you all know what pay phones are? <laughs> but anyway, we didn't have cell phones, and so I had to walk. And I, I made sure I went and walked and called my mother to let her know that I was going to be 15 minutes late. I never came in late until I got married. And I know some of you think, boy, that's just weird, and I'd never do stuff like that. But I guarantee you, as a result, my mother and I had a great relationship, man. Uh, she died uh, when she was 96, and we loved each other and had a great relationship. And I just praise God for that. You know, when I uh, gave my oldest son, the first time we allowed him to take the car and stay out, I think we told him to come home at 11 o'clock. And he got in at something like 11, uh, 11.30 or something like that. So anyway, my wife and I were there to meet him, and we told him he was 30 minutes late. And immediately he started saying, it's just 20 or 30 minutes. What does it matter? Why do you think that that's such a big deal? And, you know, I reasoned with him that, man, if something would have happened, if you'd have got a flat, if you'd have run out of gas late at night, man, you could get in trouble. And all of those things are true. But you know what the real problem is when your parents give you the freedom to go do something, they tell you to, to do something and they, they give you permission and then you violate it. You know what really the real problem is? You broke their trust. It's not how many minutes you came in late. They don't have to give you access to the car. They don't have to let you go do things. They're doing this because they're trying to let you begin to start experiencing things on your own. They're, they're putting trust in you and they tell you to come home at a certain time 
And if you don't come home at that time, you may think, well, it was only five minutes late. What's the big deal? The big deal is that they trusted you and you agreed to it and you said you would do something and you broke that trust. And then you say, well, I'm sorry and forgive me. Well, you can forgive a person, but did you know trust is not something you give a person? You have to earn trust. And your parents give you trust. They extend trust to you and to see how you're going to respond. And if you go out and violate that, you just can't give that trust back. You're, you're crazy to trust a person who doesn't deserve that trust. Now, you can forgive and you can go ahead and love, but you have to earn trust. And once you break trust, it takes a long time to build it back. So I just want to encourage you that you may not have ever looked at things from the standpoint of a parent, but, you know, once you get married, once you have kids, you will understand this a lot more. And I'm just telling you from an old man that you would be better off to never break that trust. Your parents, if you keep that trust, if you honor them, your parents, man, will back you to the limit if you earn that trust. You don't need to break that. Another thing that, that teenagers deal with, and I dealt with this a lot, was peer pressure. You know, God created us for acceptance. If anybody likes to be rejected, something's wrong with you. God created us for fellowship, not only fellowship with Him, but fellowship from each other. Nobody should like people hating you. Now, you, you can get to a place to where you can cast your care over on the Lord, and if people reject you, you can certainly deal with it, but you shouldn't like rejection. So it's just natural to want people to like you. And I actually spoke at a Christian school. This is back 30-something years ago in Kansas City, and there was 500 kids in this Christian school. And while I was waiting to speak, I picked up one of their brochures and looked at it. And the main thing that they were advertising was positive peer pressure. And I know what they were doing. They were saying that because we're in a Christian environment, because it's a Christian school, because we have Christian rules, then you will have the peer pressure uh, forcing these kids to want to live a godly life and to do certain things. And I can understand what they were saying. But did you know that that's 100% wrong? You should not let peer pressure, either positive or negative, be the influence in your life. And to prove that, I, went, I was drafted and I was sent over to Vietnam. And there was a guy that I grew up with that we were both drafted and sent to Vietnam at the same time. And we basically had the same background. We went to church together. We weren't best friends, but we knew each other. We had the same background and everything. And when we got to Vietnam, this guy just totally caved and gave in to all of the drugs, the alcohol, the sexual immorality, and did all of these kind of things. And it was because of peer pressure. In my company, there was 200 people in my company, and every two or three months they would bring all of the troops out of the field and they would put us in a rear area where it was relatively safe and they would give you all of the booze that you could drink for three days. And people just stayed totally wasted for three days. They gave you all of the dope that you could have, all free. And they brought in Filipino girls that put on a show, but they were all prostitutes. And so you had all of the sex, all of the drugs and alcohol that you could handle for three days. And that's what they did. And I was the only person out of 200 people that did not participate in that. And if I would have had peer pressure, even positive peer pressure, that you've got to do what it takes to be accepted, I would have conformed. Peer pressure should not be anything. You need to think more about what God thinks about you than what people think about you. And I can promise you this, that when I was in high school, junior high and high school, the people who were so popular and that you wanted to be like them and you wanted them to like you and stuff, I went back to a couple of my high school uh, reunions and stuff. And did you know the people who were so important and that everybody wanted to be like them they were losers. 20, 30 years later, they were absolute losers. They had been through multiple divorces. They looked terrible. Their life had been destroyed. All of these people that we thought it was so important to be like them were nothing. And I can promise you, some of the people that you feel pressure from and that you would like to be accepted by this group, man, those, those people aren't going to last. You need to get to a place to where... You have a personal relationship with the Lord 
And he's the only one that you care about. And I can truthfully say that that's what happened in my life. There's a scripture in John chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus said, How can you believe which receive honor one from another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? That's just another way of saying that if you are trying to please people and if you have to have people like you all of the time, you will never operate in God's kind of faith. You need to get to a place to where your commitment is to God. The only person you have to have His approval is Jesus. And you can literally do that. I've actually done it. When I was in the Army, uh, they, I could give you stories for hours about things that I went through. But when I was in basic training, the drill sergeant hated God, and he hated me especially. And he called me preacher. Everybody in my company called me preacher. And he would make me stand at attention while people would come up and tell the dirtiest joke they possibly could or talk about the girl that they raped over the weekend, and they would describe things and just have me stand there at attention. And he'd, he'd say, I hate you. I'd love to see you sweat. And he just did those things. But did you know, yeah, I, did, I got an opportunity to witness to every single person because of that. They knew where I stood. And when they got in trouble, those people would come and ask me. And I got to minister to all of them. And I'd have people that when I'd go into the mess hall and sit down, there'd be people sitting around. I'd set my tray down, and they'd all get up and leave. And I'd just be by myself. I went six weeks when I was in advanced infantry training without a single person saying a word to me. They wouldn't talk to me. But did you know that, uh, I don't know what happened to all of them, but there was this one guy who he was, he was blaspheming God and saying terrible things and, man, using profanity. And I was in this little place. It was about, I don't know, it was just about 10 feet by 10 feet. And there must have been 30 or 40 of us huddled down there waiting to get our paycheck and it was cold in New Jersey, and we were freezing, and we didn't have any field jacket. It was just fatigues that we were wearing. So we were all huddled together. And so this guy was just blaspheming God and saying all of these things. And I was sitting there saying, oh, God, give me an opportunity to say something. And I was just praying that I could somehow or another make a difference. And right as I said that, this guy just stopped. And he says, you know, this is no way for a good old Schofield carrying Baptist to talk. Schofield is a Bible. And he had a Schofield Bible. He says, I shouldn't be talking this way. And I said, you got a Schofield Bible? And he goes, yeah, do you have one? I said, I sure do. I said, you ought to read yours every once in a while. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? And I gave him some scriptures about it. God will not hold him guiltless. It takes his name in vain. And I said some other things. Boy, this guy, he was a big guy. And he started pushing his way through that crowd. And he got right up to my face. And I said, one other verse, Galatians 4, 16 says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? <laughs> and man, he just froze and turned his back. And for the next 15 or 20 minutes, not a single word was said. And it turned out I was put with that group of people. And every time I'd go put my tray down to eat, they'd all just scatter. And for six weeks, not a single person talked to me. But did you know, many years later, 20 years later, uh, I was on television, and this guy was w in another room, and he heard my voice, and he came running into that room, and he says, I know that voice. And it turned out that that turned his life around, and he repented and became a, past a pastor of an Assembly of God church, and he finally came to one of my meetings and told me that he never was able to sleep until he got right with God after all of that. And so anyway, I'm just saying that, you know what, it's lonely sometimes to do the right thing, but I'm telling you, do not let a fear of people's rejection deal with you. You know, there was an instance where Joseph was sold into slavery. You may know that story from Genesis chapter 37 and 39. And he was sold into slavery. And he had been the favorite son. He was pampered by his father. He had the coat of many colors. He had all of these things going for him. And yet he uh, was still serving God. He became promoted and became the head of all of the slaves in the house. And then the master's wife tried to seduce him. And because he wouldn't give in to her, she eventually accused him of raping her. And um, anyway, he got thrown into prison for it. But the point I was wanting to point out in, in Genesis chapter 39, when she pressed on him and tried to get him to have sexual relationships with her, he said, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? 
Now that is really important. If he would have only been doing what was right because of being accepted by his family, accepted by his peers, nobody would have blamed him. Matter of fact, the master's wife wasn't going to tell on him because it would have been her own uh, neck that would have been at risk. So he could have gotten by with it. If the only reason you're going to do what's right is because you won't get caught, then you have no character. True character is doing what's right regardless of what anybody else says. And you need to be just like Joseph and say, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? When I was in Vietnam, that's the thing that kept me from participating in what everybody else did is because I had a relationship with God. And it didn't matter. If I was on the other side of the world, I could have done things. Nobody would have ever known what I did. But you know what? God knew. And that's the, that's the only thing that kept me was my personal relationship with God. And I can guarantee you these people that are seems to be so important in your life and all of the cool kid, or I don't know what terminology you use nowadays to describe those. Anyway, but these kids that you want to be accepted with and stuff, it won't be very long until those kids have their own problems. There's not anything to envy in them. Man, I praise God so much that I did not give place to all of those kind of things. And I'm just encouraging you that you don't have to live that way. The only person that you can't live without is Jesus and his opinion of you. And you need to get to that place. And I tell you, you can't just decide this and all of a sudden all of your desire to be accepted is gone. That's not the way it works. You have to have such a personal relationship with God to where He literally fills all of your desires so that you don't need anybody else. It all stems out of a relationship. If you don't have a real relationship, not just, it's not a matter of just doing what's right and doing the right thing. It's about all about relationship with the Lord. And the reason that God told us to live a certain way is because He's the one that made us. He knows what makes you happy. And I can guarantee you, I deal with people all the time who have regrets about stuff and it comes back to haunt them. You don't want to have to deal with that. Now God can forgive you and make things good, but man, you just don't want to have to deal with all that stuff. And nowadays, did you know that anything you text, anything you take a picture, any of these things are going to be on the internet forever. There's no such thing as hiding it. And if you go to doing some things and then someday the Lord wants you to run for office or he wants you to be a pastor or he wants you to do anything and people want to come against you, they will drag up any rotten thing that you've ever said or ever done. It's all on the Internet. It cannot be erased. You do not want to do this. And even if there wasn't an Internet, well, you still don't want the devil to have an inroad into your life. You know, a scripture that the Lord used in my life that when I was young that really ministered to me is because I was trying to dis discern what is right and wrong was Romans 14, 23. And the last half of that verse says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So anything that I had to wonder, is this right? Is it wrong? If you wonder about it, if it's not something that you know to be right, well then, according to that verse, it's sin. And so if I had to question it, I just didn't do it. That'll keep you on the straight and narrow. I'm just about out of time, and there's a lot more things I just want to say in here. Well, let me, well, I need to go back over. I'm supposed to introduce Stephen Bransford at 1020. So anyway, I've still got some time. But uh, let me say that another thing I was talking about is that I read that suicide has become probably... Uh, the largest uh, cause of death in young people today, which, man, this, this is just weird, weird to me. Did you know, when I was a kid, we might have thought of killing somebody else but never thought of killing ourselves. And it's amazing how this has become popular somehow or another. People will cite depression and things, and I, I've got so much material on all this. i got a book entitled How to Harness Your Emotions. But did your emotions, emotions just follow your thoughts? This is really important if you understand this. Emotions are not the engine that drives the train. Emotions are the caboose 
they, of course, they don't even have cabooses on trains today. You kids probably don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, it's not the last, it's not the last uh, car on the train. Your emotions are a byproduct of what you think on. If you're depressed, it's because you're thinking on depressing things. It's because you're focused on all of the negative things in your life. And again, this peer pressure, and there's just so many other things that enter in, they will talk about that you don't have this and you don't have that and you aren't as athletic, you aren't as good looking as somebody else or your grades aren't as good or your situation at home. There's bad things in every one of our lives. I've got so many bad things in my life right now. Some of you may not understand that, but I've got so many pressures on me that if I was to look at all of the negative things that are coming at me, I could be as depressed as any person in here. And some of you may doubt that. I'm not going to spend the time to prove it, but it's absolutely true. It just depends on what you look at. You can focus on positive things. The Bible says, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. It's your choice. If you are depressed or discouraged, it's because of where your focus is. And I can guarantee you, if you are depressed about the future or about your current situation, you aren't looking at things from God's standpoint. God has a perfect plan for your life. I mean a perfect plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope and a future. God has a plan for every person. Psalms 139, I believe it's verse 16, says that before you even came forth out of your mother's womb, God had written in a book every day of your life what it was supposed to be like. Now, he won't force it on you. You get to choose. You can totally go off the rails and choose your own way. But God had a plan written for you before you were even born. And I can guarantee you God's plans for you are good. They're for good things. God never made a piece of junk. God's never made a failure. God's never destined any person to just be depressed and discouraged. If that's the way that you're living, it's because you aren't focused on what God's plan for your life is. God has a perfect plan for you. You know, I'm 75 years old now, and I can look back and see that God has blessed me so much more than I ever could have done on my own. There is no way that the things that have happened in my life could have happened under my wisdom and stuff. But just when you submit yourselves to God, God will do things in your life that are better than you could ever do for yourself. You know, I had my son die, and he was dead for four and a half hours. And anyway, it's a long story, but because of seeking the Lord and having the Word of God in my life, my wife and I just agreed and prayed, and my son was in a morgue in the freezer with a toe tag on, stripped naked, had been dead for over four hours, and he just sat up and started talking. And today he's alive and well. He's the one that puts up these screens. He's the one that put up these screens right here. He works for us. And one year later, he had a daughter. It's one of the few people that can say they were born one year after their dad died. And you know how all that happened? Because I just put God first and because I love God. And I've been rejected and criticized by people and it's cost me some things. But I guarantee you, God's acceptance, His goodness to you is greater than anything it'll ever cost you. You need to just put God first. Love God with your whole heart. And I promise you, if you do that, you'll never regret it. So this is some advice from an old man to young teenagers that, man, you just need to dedicate yourself to God. You are not too early to do it. You need to be doing this now. It'll save you a lot of hurt. It'll save you a lot of mistakes. And God can help you to overcome any mistakes you make, but I can guarantee you, you will not regret serving God. You will not regret going out there and experimenting and doing all of these things. You know, I'm 75, I've never taken a drink of liquor, I've never smoked a cigarette, I've never said a word of profanity, Todd's done everything that I didn't do, <laughs> and God loves Todd just as much as he loves me, and you know, you can prosper doing that, but man, I just praise God that I didn't ever go through any of that stuff. 
And I'm sure that Todd, if you were to ask him, he would say he, he you know, God loves him and he's totally forgiven. There's no difference whatsoever. But man, I, he'd have loved to have given his life to the Lord earlier. You will not regret serving God with your whole heart. You will regret if you don't do it with your whole heart. And so I'm just encouraging you. I've been down the road that you're going on. And you may say, well, you're different than me. But you know what? I have been through a few things that you will be going through. And I can promise you that you will regret it if you don't follow the Lord, if you don't turn your life over to the Lord. So it would be wisdom for you right now to just commit yourself to God with everything you've got. Amen? Amen. 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 So I've got this little book. It's only, I think, 50 pages or something like that, 55 pages. And uh, it's just a real brief thing, but I'd like to give this to each one of you. And uh, it's something that you could reference and go back over and it'd be a blessing. Anybody got any questions here before I have to go? Yes, ma'am. How do you deal with a sibling that is rebellious? How do you deal with a sibling that is rebellious and overly sensitive? You just love your siblings. Uh, love is a thing that never fails. First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse eight. And so you just have to love them. It's not you aren't the parent. You can't really correct them. All you can do is just love them and praise God that. Pray that they'll turn around. All right. Are we going to use a microphone here? Yep, we got we some got hands one. up. Right here. Okay. Oh, um, I have a similar question. It's just my little sister, she's always been, like, really rebellious, and she doesn't really go to the Lord. Like, I just want to know how I can help her with that. First of all, you need to recognize that this is not just natural. Rebellion is demonic. And so you need to love her. Love will cast out all sin. It will overcome everything. And if you can, put the Word of God in her. Uh, man, if she would listen, to, take this little booklet, share that with her. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff, but you've got to get the Word to her. you got to uh, take your authority and rebuke that. But, but if you respond and give her reasons to be angry at you, it's just going to push her far, farther away. I'd say you just need to walk in love towards her. All right, somebody else? Where's the mic? Okay. I know you're doing like a lot of TV programs. So do you ever get like stressed and mad whenever like you're really sh just doing a lot of TV programs? No, I don't. But I would say that a lot of people do. You know, I and again, I am not trying to present it that I do everything perfectly. That is not true. But my children now are, I've got one child that's 50-something uh, years old. I guess they're both over 50. And they said they have never seen me angry in their entire life. I just don't get angry because of my personal relationship with the Lord. Now, that's not to say that if you get angry, something is terribly wrong. But it's not the way God meant it to be. And you can get to where you uh, anger. I've got an entire teaching on this entitled Self-Centeredness, the Source of All Grief. But it's only your self-love that makes you angry. When you get to where you love God and other people more than you love yourself, you can overcome anger. Anger is not normal. It's not just your personality type. If you are an angry person, you are a very self-centered person. And the answer to it is to give up your life to the Lord. Okay? Who's next? How do you practically serve God? Well, that's a big question. There's a lot of different things involved in serving God, but I would say that you have to know the Word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, you won't know what God's will for your life is. You know, the verses that changed my life around, I was seeking God's will. In Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And verse 2 says, And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So those two verses really kind of summarize the entire Christian life in a nutshell. You have to be totally committed to God as a living sacrifice and then renew your mind through the Word of God. The Word of God is the only way that He's revealed to us what is right and wrong. You can't just go by your own feelings. There are people today waking up and saying, well, I feel like a woman today in a man's body. That is absolutely stupid. 
That is not true. And this is another thing I've got in this little booklet. I didn't get to it. But today, people are being so confused. The Bible is the absolute standard of right and wrong. Do not let this culture conform you or confuse you about things like this. That is wrong. I don't know if you've heard this, but every man has an X and a Y chromosome in every cell of their body. A woman has two X chromosomes. And if you were to die a hundred years after your death, you could dig up a body and examine a toe bone and tell whether that was a man or a woman by whether it has X chromosomes or X and Y chromosomes. This whole, it's scientific that you are either a man or a female. And yet, people today are saying, no, I'm a woman in a man's body. Well, you can love them and you can help them, but that is wrong. That is not true. And you see, the Word of God will teach you these things. It says, Jesus said from the beginning, He made them male and female. That's all He created was men and women. The Democrats created all of the other genders. <laughs> Amen. All right, who's next? Uh, I don't hear a lot about Deborah and JL. Is there anything about their stories that, what, what it teaches us and all that? So. Well, Deborah was a great judge, and, you know, this was during a time that women didn't have the same privileges that they do today. And so the fact that God used Deborah to do a great deliverance for the Israelites, there's a lot of things you could learn from that, but that would be another teaching, but it's really good. Back here. Anybody? In the Anybody corner. Here? Okay. Um, yeah. How do you, do you know how we can build a hunger and a desire for God? Like where we actually come to desire those things above, you know, anything else in life? That is a great question. And you know, there is a scripture that says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's like you take a, you give somebody a free sample of something and man, if it's good, they'll want more of that. And so you take it, and you can develop an appetite for things. And so really it starts by just tasting and seeing. I would go to the Word of God and pray and say, Lord, show me things from your Word. And, you know, let me say this. I have seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen people come out of wheelchairs. I've seen every kind of miracle. I've seen people with rods in their back that it was impossible for them to bend over. They started bending over and touching their toes. I've seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle, and yet the greatest experience I've ever had in my life is reading the Word and having that Word come alive and God speak to me. The disciples said in Luke chapter 24, it says, it was like fire shut up in my bones. And I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but it really, I mean, it's the greatest thing when God Almighty, who's got a universe to run, takes time to speak to you and takes the truth from the Word and makes it come alive. It's the greatest experience I've ever had. And if you ever start getting into the Word of God and asking God to speak to you, and if He ever speaks to you like that and gives you direction that's going to transform your life, you'll become addicted to it. That's the kind of addiction. The scripture talks about submit yourself to those who've addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. There are good addictions, and studying the word is one of them. Amen. Who's next? Okay. Um, I wanted to know what your opinion on like self-defense was because I'm someone who used to get in trouble for fighting a lot in school because of how people would talk to me or talk to people I cared about. So do you believe that I should just let stuff slide or... I should be able to defend myself. Well, I couldn't give you a d definitive answer without knowing the exact situation. There are some things that are worth fighting for. But, again, I've got this little booklet entitled Self-Centeredness, the Source of All Greed. Most uh, anger is because you are just thinking about yourself. My brother was the opposite of me. He was a very angry, violent person. And... Uh, he would beat the snot out of me. I mean, just, he, he if I, back in those days, uh, nowadays you'd have to go to the hospital over some of the things my brother did to me. I could have gotten stitches, but back in those days you just, you know, suffered through it. You didn't go to the doctor unless you were dying. And uh, anyway, my, the reason I bring this up is to say that my brother would beat me and do things, and then when he settled down, 
he would say, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was hurting you. And what he was, what he was saying was he was so focused on himself, something done to him that hurt him that he didn't think about anybody but himself. If you were to think about other people, it diffuses anger. Anger is self-centered. It says Proverbs chapter 13, by, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. That's the only reason that you get angry is when you are just focused on yourself. If you could focus on the other person, it would help diffuse your anger. So again, there are some things that it may be worth fighting for uh, if you're defending yourself or defending someone else, but most of it is just anger, and that needs to, you need to overcome that. So I don't know your specific situation without talking to you. Okay. All right? All right. Shannon? Hi. Um, my friend struggles with depression, and because of that depression, she struggles with, like, vaping and stuff. So she says she's a Christian, but she still struggles with that stuff, so I want to know if there's a way where I can help her out. Well, again, if people would understand that the source of depression isn't things that people are saying about you and things like this, it's because you are so dependent upon people's approval. So the source isn't what's being done to you, it's the deficiency that's on the inside of you. You know, let me give you this little example. When I was in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher took a one-gallon gas can, a metal gas can, and put it on a Brunson burner and heated it until it was glowing red hot. And then he put the cap on. And then he just set that uh, gas can on his desk. And I was sitting on the front row, and so it was just a few feet away from me. And he went about teaching. And over an hour or two, that thing began to cool down. And what he was trying to illustrate is that cold air condenses and occupies a smaller volume than hot air. Hot air expands, cold air contracts. And so as this can cool down, it formed a vacuum on the inside. And that can, without anybody touching it, it just began to crack and pop and it bent in two and fell off of his desk right at my feet. And I remember that and the Lord spoke to me and he says, it's not the pressure without that is the real problem. It's the vacuum on the inside that causes us hurt. If you were really full of God's love, you just get to a place to where the rejection by other people doesn't bother you. So it's not a matter of saying, I'm not going to be offended by this person because that, that's just your self-will trying to do it. But what you do, you fill yourself with the love of God and you let God just fill you to where you're so full of God. It doesn't matter if somebody else does things to you. So this vaping, those are all ways of coping with pressure. And yet God wants you to turn to Him. If you would turn to God when people criticize you, He will tell you how much He loves you. Now, you've got to learn these things through the Word of God, so you need to spend time in the Word. But the way to deal with pressure and rejection isn't to ignore it or just to say, I'm going to be strong and go through it. No, you turn to the Lord. You cast your care over on Him, and you let Him fill you with His love. And when that happens, I guarantee you, it, it, you just get so full of God that it doesn't matter. I actually had some of the leaders in this county come here during 2020 and they were telling me that we're going to put you in jail because you aren't wearing masks and you aren't doing this and they got to threatening me and this one man a county commissioner came up and he said you have no integrity because I wouldn't follow their rules and he said terrible things about me that you wouldn't say about anybody and you know this may not have been the right way to respond but the way I responded I just told this guy I said look I've been criticized by people a lot more important than you. And I said, God loves me, and I don't care what you think. And that's the way I responded to it. <laughs> so, you know what? You get to where if you're fellowshipping with God Almighty, King of kings and Lord of lords, who cares if this insignificant person over here rejects you? The only people that will ever let you down are the ones that you lean on. So don't lean on anybody but Jesus, and I guarantee you, you'll never have to deal with that. All right, Josh. Uh, how do you get better at ministering to people? Well, a lot of it is experience, but you have to have the right message. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to know what the Word says, and most people don't know what the Word says, but the Word has an answer for everything, everything. There is nothing that you will ever deal with, no problem in a person's life that isn't recorded in the Bible 
So you need to know the Word, but then as you minister to other people, you'll see what works and you'll see what doesn't work. So you have to have the foundation of the Word, but you also need to have experience. You'll grow in it as you minister to other people. Okay, hand. Shannon? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is kind of like not like kind of a weird question. I don't know if you can answer it, but my dad, he's been sick with Lyme disease for 10 plus years. And I've prayed for him and done everything that I can. My mom's also sick, and my grandma has stage 4 cancer and stuff. And, you know, I've prayed and I've begged and all this stuff, and they're just not getting better. And my dad can't provide for our family financially. The judge keeps denying his disability money, which he worked for his entire life whenever he made, like, $100,000 a year. And, you know, it causes him with depression and his trauma. But he's the most amazing guy that I have ever known, and I just want him to get better. So and he's a believer? Yes. He's... Well, it's God's will for him to be well. And there's multiple reasons why healing doesn't always manifest, but it's never God's fault. Uh, it's always something that we're doing. I could, I could give you a thousand of examples, but it'd take a long time. But you just need to know that it's not God's fault. God wants him well. God wants your family, all of your grandmother, everybody to be well. And uh, you, you need to just stick your nose in the Word, continue to learn, and as God shows you things, you'll become more effective in praying. But He needs to believe, too. We've got two people right here on staff. Matter of fact, they were pay, playing a video uh, in the main auditorium this morning of one of the guys who had Crohn's disease and was totally healed. But uh, Clay Caldwell, who I'm sure he's been down here sometime, he's always involved with the youth. He had Crohn's disease, and he got totally healed of it. Uh, through being here, so God can certainly do it. That's, it's not God that's not healing them. It's just somehow or another. When you've had something in you for a long time, it's not only your body that gets sick, but your mind gets sick. You get used to it. You get to you you get discouraged, thinking, "Well, I've prayed before, nothing's going to happen." So you've, it's the renewing of the mind. I'm not sure the exact answer for your situation, but I can promise you, it's not God that's failed. All right, Josh. Um, my dad passed away when I was 12 years old, and I just wanted to know how you coped with that. You know, I, I turned to the Lord, and I remember, I think it was either the night that he died or the night after, I turned to uh, Psalms 27.10, and it says, When your father or your mother forsake you, then the Lord will take you up. Now, my dad didn't forsake me in the sense that he did something wrong. He wasn't intentional, but nonetheless, he wasn't there. I grew up without a dad. And I turned to the Lord, and God became my father. And that's your answer. You know, some, some people today think that if you don't have a father in the home, well, then that's justification for you doing all kinds of rebellious stuff and acting. I never went through that. I never went through a period of rebellion because I turned to the Lord, and uh, that's what you need to do. And I guarantee you, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And if you'll just call out, go to that scripture, Psalms 27.10. And say, Father, my earthly father is gone, and I believe you're going to take me up. I want you to be my father. And I guarantee you, he'll go to loving you and speaking to you, and you'll, you'll be better off. It'll actually work out for good. It'll be awesome. All right. Shannon? Um, so I don't have a problem talking to, like, adults, but I kind of have a problem talking to people my own age about Jesus. So how do I get better at talking about Jesus. Well, again, I would suspect that that's a fear of rejection. And the answer to that is to get so full of God's acceptance that you just don't care that much about whether people reject you or not. So it, it's a fear of man. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 that the fear of man brings a snare. And you just, you're, you're going to deal with this the rest of your life. Again, if you like rejection, something's wrong with you, but you can't let a fear of rejection stop you in the way you overcome it. Perfect love will cast out that fear. First John chapter 4, verse 18. All right, who else? Man, you guys got a lot of great questions. Um, awesome. You mentioned earlier that you haven't said a word of profanity, you haven't taken any alcohol. Um, I've also heard that you have never had a sip of coffee. <laughs> Is there a reason for this? Even I drink coffee. <laughs> like, come on, I'm very confused. I just use that kind of as a joke, but I never have tasted coffee. I don't know why. I just never got into coffee, and then I heard so many people talking about being addicted to it and how can I get over it, and I thought, well, man, if it's going to be a problem, I just never start. 
So I've never tasted coffee. But you've got a scripture you can stand on for drinking coffee. You know what that is? Mark chapter 16, verse 18. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. <laughs> All right, who's next? Um, you said that in the Old Testament they didn't have Jesus, so they had to like just cut off the sin, right? So why didn't God send Jesus earlier? Well, that's a great question, and I happen to have an entire series entitled The Authority of the Believer, about eight hours worth of teaching that will explain that. But in a nutshell, it's because God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and he gave authority over this earth to physical human beings. Since he didn't have a physical body, he had to become a man to earn back the right to rule and control this earth. But the way he created Adam, he spoke him into existence. There was no resistance. There was nobody to hinder him. But after Adam sinned, Satan was the god of this world. People had authority. And God had to speak Jesus into existence through people. All of those prophecies. And when the angel came to Mary, it said that he took the word of God and the Word became the incorruptible seed, and that's how she conceived. So anyway, it took 4,000 years for God to find people that were submitted enough to Him to speak everything that needed to be done for Jesus to come into the earth. He came at the fullness of time as soon as He possibly could. All right, over here. So what do you mean by being dedicated to God? Like, does not mean that you're born again or something else? Well, being born again is the first step in being dedicated to God. But you could be born again, and here's another way of saying it. You could be born again and yet just doing what you want to do. You don't care what God wants you to do. You're going to do what you want to do. You're going to pick your own path for your life and stuff. That's not being dedicated to God. Being dedicated to God means that you recognize He created you. He has a plan for your life, and so you're going to submit to Him and dedicate your life to what He has for you. And it's not going to be you asking God to bless your plans, but you're asking God to show you His plans, and you'll do whatever He wants you to do. So that's another way of saying it. Yes? So I was wondering about the story of when your wife got raised from the dead. Well, this was, uh, it wasn't like my son that was dead for four and a half hours. We were walking up to see Doc Holliday's grave in uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and she had a brand new camera, and she was looking at the camera, and we were on a steep hill like this, and somebody had knocked out the uh, sidewalk to make a drive to go in, and so there was a drop about like that, and she was looking at her camera and didn't pay attention, and she stepped off that thing, and instead of putting out her hands to catch her, she didn't want to mess up her camera, so she grabbed the camera and she ran right into the other curb on the other side and hit herself right in the chest, and it just stopped her heart. And we have a doctor on my board who uh, later told us what happened, that when you get hit really hard in the chest, it can literally stop your heart. And so her heart just stopped, and she passed out. I was praying for her, and these people there, they called 911, and it took about 10 minutes for... Uh, uh, ambulance to come and 10 minutes after she came back to life I was praying over her and commanding her to come back to life 10 minutes after she came back to life they checked her pulse and it was only up to 40 beats a minute which probably most of you are your heart's beating at 60 or 70 beats per minute is normal she was only up to about half 10 minutes later her heart had just stopped and so it was really funny because later that night we uh we're laying in bed getting ready to go to sleep, and she broke out laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? And she said, do you realize that they called 911 from the cemetery, and they showed up? <laughs> that was kind of funny. All right. Um, I was just wondering, um, how do you get, like, a better prayer life? Like, how do you get better at praying? I just happened to have a book on that <laughs> entitled A Better Way to Pray. And I guarantee you, if you were to read that book, that book would set you free. Most people think you have to have your eyes closed. But prayer is just communion with God. And I pray all day long, every single day. You, you, the Bible says pray without ceasing. So anyway, that book would be the best answer I have to that. It would really, really help you. Okay. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? 
well, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be hard to say. I would, uh, I would say probably the uh, instruction that the Word of God is the most important thing that I'll ever do, most important thing. I study the Word. I've studied the Word today. I study the Word all of the time. If I want to have a good time, I'll spend eight hours studying the Word. It's awesome. The Word of God will make you perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So that's the most important thing you can do is get into the Word of God. Yes, sir. Um, since uh, God has the power to do everything and the devil is the reason why Adam and Eve sinned, why hasn't God just destroyed them to get them out of here so that nobody can sin anymore? That's a really good question. And again, I've answered that in my book on the authority of the believer. <laughs> But it all comes down to this thing that God gave authority over this earth to people. And God is, wasn't a people. He was, he was a spirit. And so he would have had to have broke, broken his word to come down here and destroy the devil and to set everything straight because he gave authority to Adam and Eve. And it wasn't an authority with any strings attached. Like, if you will do what I want you to, then I give you authority. No, he said, you have authority. You can do anything you want to. And they, of their own free will, chose to empower the devil. And if God would have come down and have violated what he told them, the whole universe would have self-destruct because it says in Hebrews 1.3, it's held together by the integrity of his word. So he didn't have the authority. God doesn't have the authority to come and just touch people and make things happen. He gave authority to people and God will only change things in this physical world as people submit to him. A scripture that people quote often is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 that says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, but then it goes on to say, according to the power that works in us. God cannot, or you, you could say it this way, God will not operate independent of people. He flows through people. And the reason Satan is doing the things that he's doing in our world today is because so many people are cooperating with the devil. The devil can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. He can't make you depressed, make you sick, make you fearful. He can't do anything unless you submit to him. And he only has lies. He doesn't have any power. He has to have you yield. This is why knowing the truth, which Jesus said the word of God is truth, the truth will set you free because you, you won't submit to those lies. So anyway, that's a real quick answer. Again, I've got an entire book on that and a whole series on the authority of the believer that will explain that. But God just cannot move independent. You could say will not. It's his choice. He, he gave us authority. He's not going to force his will upon any person. He will protect your right to go to hell if you want to. He will not let anybody force you to be saved. Anybody else? So uh, how do you come up with all these books? <laughs> well, I've been spending 56 years writing them. In 56 years, you might be able to write 100 and something books. It'll work. Awesome. Anybody else? I feel called to praise and worship, but I'm scared that I'm going to follow that path and it's going to turn out that I'm just following my heart and not what God wants me to do. So how do I know that that's what God is actually calling me to? You know, that's a very good question. And the answer to that is Psalms 37.4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean he'll give you anything you want, but it means when you are delighting yourself in the Lord, when you put God first, he will put his desires in your heart. So the key is just, God, I'm going to love you more than anyone or anything else. And when you, the Bible says you know whether you're doing that or not. And if God is truly the focus of your life, then you can do whatever you want to because he'll put his desires in your heart. If you... Put your attention on the Lord and love Him and desire the Lord. Your desire will either grow or if, you, if that was your desire and it wasn't God's desire, it'll diminish. So the key is just loving God, seeking first the kingdom of God, and He'll give you everything else. Amen. Anybody else? Um, so why do you think God made the tree of evil? 
That's a good question. Eden. Uh, Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's, yeah. it's because God didn't want a robot. God is not going to force any person to serve him. Nobody. He wants you to love him of your own free will. And if he hadn't have given us a choice, if he had have made us so that we just were like a robot, we were programmed and we couldn't do anything unless uh, he told us to, that wouldn't have been love. Love is when a person voluntarily does things. So God is a God of love. It says over in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16 that God is love. That is his basic character and nature. And he doesn't want us to love him because we have no choice. Because we, we've told, you know, he could put his thumb on you and say, say you love me. But that wouldn't be love. That would just be doing what you're forced to do. So that's the reason he gave us a choice. I happen to have a book on that subject <laughs> entitled, uh, Who Told You That You Were Naked? It's a really great teaching. Anybody else? I was wondering about, you said something about the renewing of your mind, and I was wondering how would you do that? The renewing of your mind is Romans 12, too. It says, don't be conformed to this world. The word conform means to be poured into the mold. Life is a fire, and you're going to get melted. You are going to be changed. You can't exit life the way you came into life, but you get to pick which mold you fit into. So don't be poured into the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the renewing of your mind is where you take God's word and you just go by what it says. You know, you may sit there and, and desire something that's completely contrary to the word. The way you renew your mind is to say, I'm not going to go by what I want. I'm going to go by what God's word tells me right here. That's the renewing of your mind. You just reprogram. You know, all of you are, are used to computers. Man, I remember when they came out and said that everybody's going to have their own computer someday, and I laughed like, who in the world would want your own computer? <laughs> now we got computers everywhere. But, you know, computers, you, pr uh, you program a computer, and it will function the way it's programmed. And that's the way that your brain is. Your brain was programmed by your sinful human nature to be selfish to not want to be told what to do. You don't want to submit. You're going to do what you want to do. You're the center of the universe. That's the way that the selfish human nature programs you. This will reprogram you or renew your mind. So you take the Word of God and you just submit yourself to whatever it says. And that will reprogram you, renew your mind. Somebody else. Um, if angels were created without free will, and in God's um, light, there's no room for darkness. How was Lucifer able to have pride in heaven? I don't think angels were created without a free will. So did they have free will? Even yeah, I think angels have a free will. That's the reason Lucifer rebelled. So in heaven, um, are you not able to sin anymore, or is he still able to have sin? You know, I've, I've thought of that question. I don't know that I can answer it, but I think that when we see God in all of his glory, and majesty, we are going to be so overwhelmed that he forgave us and loved us that, man, we aren't going to want to sin anymore. So I don't have a full answer for that, but I know that in heaven there's no more sorrow, there's no more sickness, there's no more pain, which means that sin is not dominant. So, uh, But I don't know that God is ever going to force us or take away our free will, but I think we will be so overwhelmed by God that it'll, it'll change our heart. I've already had my heart changed, and I've just seen a very small glimpse of who God is. When we see the glory of God and see the way that he's loved us and forgiven us, I think that, man, we're going to spend the rest of our life wanting to just worship him and love him. All right, who's next? Um, so if you've got immature, like, younger siblings hanging out with you and... But you're trying to hang out with friends. How do you deal with that? Because they tend to be on the more childish side, and you're trying to have a well again. It'd be hard for me to answer that without knowing the details. But that goes back to uh, your siblings uh, keeping you from doing what you want to do, and that's selfish. Did you know it's not about what you want to do? And you know, someday, 
Someday you're going to grow up and, and those siblings, those younger siblings are going to be adults and they may be some of your very best friends and you don't want to do things that will hurt that relationship and stuff. So uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's appropriate sometimes to just tell your younger siblings that I don't want to have you around my friends, but I'd say that most of the time that just really sounds like you're just thinking about yourself and you ought to think about others and bless others, get to where you even enjoy blessing your younger siblings. I was always the baby in the family, so I was the one that bothered everybody else. <laughs> All right, who's next? Yes. Um, so whenever Adam and Eve ate the apple and they got casted out of the Garden of e Eden, why didn't God just make another set of people? Like, why didn't he just, <laughs> like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, why didn't he just make, more godly people and then let if that just kept on happening they just casted them out i don't know like how to make that not well uh, did you know god loved adam and eve so much that he didn't want to just throw them aside he had plans to save them the bible says that jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that means that even before he created adam and eve he knew that adam and eve would rebel at him did you know most of us, because we think of things only from our perspective, most of us, if we knew that Adam and Eve were going to rebel and that the whole human race was going to turn against him, most of us wouldn't have created man. But God knew what was going to happen and went ahead and created us anyway because it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. And you know what that joy was? It was you and me. God saw you and me and the fact that someday we would turn to him and that we would love him. And he thought that all of the suffering that the whole human race has put him through is worth it just because of the few who would turn to him. So uh, I don't believe that God wanted to just, you know, push Adam and Eve to the side. That's the way we would do because we're only thinking about our hurt. God was thinking about the human race, and he loved us so much. He was willing to endure all of the stuff that we put him through just for those of us who would accept him. That's how much he loves us. Okay. All right. Do we need to take a break? We got more questions still? Oh, I'm going good. Okay. <laughs> when Jesus when Jesus went or when he was crucified and died and went to hell for three days, um, he preached in hell, right? And then did did the people in hell get a chance then to go to heaven, like believe on Jesus and go to heaven? Nope. And the reason that that's a little confusing is because in the old covenant, before Jesus brought in the new covenant, the Greek word, or excuse me, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament was sheol. They went to a place called Sheol, and that word Sheol was, was translated the pit, the grave, hell, things like that. But there was actually two compartments to this area called Sheol. And you can see this in, when Jesus gave the parable about the rich man and, and Lazarus. The rich man died and went to hell, and he could see Lazarus over in the part called Paradise. And... Uh, he could see him, and he asked Abraham to have Lazarus dip his finger in water and come and cool his tongue because he was tormented in the flame. And Abraham said, there's a great gulf between us. You can't pass between these two. But everybody in the old covenant who died went into the grave, and there's other scriptures that talk about going into the earth. Sheol, hell, is in the center of the earth, and it used to have a compartment that was called Abraham's bosom. But when Jesus died, he went into hell, and then he took death and hell captive, and he took the saints, the godly people that were in that part of Sheol, and he took them to heaven. And so now there isn't a paradise anymore that's in the center of the earth. It's now people go to be with the Lord in heaven, and someday when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth, and he's going to create a new heavens and earth. There won't be hell anymore after the second return of the Lord, but he's going to create what the Bible in Revelation calls a lake of fire. And people that were in hell will be put in this lake of fire where they will be burned forever and ever. So hell at the moment is in the center of the earth. It used to be called Sheol that had two compartments in it. When Jesus died, 
He took all of the godly dead to heaven and now all that's left in hell is the ungodly dead. Yes. Um, so earlier when you were talking about anger, if, if I heard you right, then I remember you saying that anger was unnatural. Um, I'm just remembering one or two Bible verses. Uh, one that says, uh, in your anger, do not sin. And another one, uh, another passage where it's talking about Jesus and the temple, how he went and uh, was angry and overturned the money uh, changer ta tables in that's, the temple. That's very astute. There is a godly anger. That scripture that you were quoting, Ephesians 4, 28, says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. There is a godly type of anger. God gave every one of us the capacity for anger, but it's supposed to be directed at the devil, not at people. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which says we don't wrestle or fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You're supposed to be angry at the devil. You're supposed to be angry at sickness. You're supposed to be angry at poverty, at depression, discouragement. It's okay to be angry at those things, but not angry at people. What I was talking about, I didn't say that uh, anger is not natural. I said that uh, everybody has a tendency to it, but the kind of anger that they were talking about where you are defending yourself, you are fighting because somebody hurt you, that's all rooted in selfishness. And Proverbs, again, 13.10 says, Only by pride comes contention. It didn't say it's a leading cause. It's a major cause. It's the only cause. The only reason people get mad at other people is because you are focused on yourself. You know, let me give you an example of this that, you know, I, I believe the Bible teaches in capital punishment that if a person kills, that uh, putting them to death after they've been through a trial and stuff is scriptural and it def deters other people from going out and committing those kind of sins. So the Bible teaches that in Genesis chapter 9 and other places. But uh, I was watching a television program one time and it showed a man who had raped a girl and then he had killed her trying to cover up his sin and he was convicted and put on death row. And uh, this program was trying to turn people against capital punishment and saying that you ought to just lock people up for life, but you shouldn't ever kill a person like that. And so even though I believed, according to Scripture, that capital punishment is scriptural, I was watching this, and they showed this man, and they showed him sitting in his jail cell, and he was so depressed, and he had his hands, uh, you know, uh, propping up his head, and he was just depressed. It showed his jail cell, and it was playing this sad music. It went from color to black and white, and everything was just showing you how miserable this guy was. And then it uh, went to his baby pictures. And it showed pictures of him as a little baby. And it showed him riding a stick horse and playing and doing things. And then he was abused as a child and he was treated terribly. And as you saw his side of things and what had happened to him, then it came back to his jail cell. And you, you felt pity for this guy. And you thought, man... There's bound to be some better way to deal with this. And even though I believed in capital punishment, I was actually wavering in my feelings about it because of looking at how sad it was in this guy's life. And while I was looking at that, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, what would happen if you took the girl's baby pictures that he raped and murdered and showed her playing as a little kid and growing up, and maybe she had plans to get married and some pervert comes into her life and for self-gratification rapes her and then kills her. The same people watching that thing would turn into a vigilante committee that would want to string that guy up from the nearest tree if they saw it from her standpoint or if you see it from his standpoint. And the Lord just spoke to me that it really depends on how you process things as to how you respond. And if you are only thinking of yourself and you don't know why people do what they do, 
you will be angry every single time. But when you get to where you love God more than you love yourself and you love other people more than you love yourself, it will literally take hatred out of your heart. Now, there is a godly hatred against evil, but I'm talking about hatred for people. It will literally stop it if you get to where you love God and other people more than you love yourself. And I just happen to have a book on that. Self-centeredness, the source of all grace. All right. This can be the last one. Um, what was the best memory with your dad before he passed away? You know, I don't have very many memories of my dad. I really don't because my dad, he actually died when I was two. And our Baptist church prayed and he was raised from the dead. They had him out in the hall and they had him on a stretcher and they were taking him down to the morgue. And our Baptist church was staying up and praying all night long. And at like two in the morning, our Baptist pastor says, I believe God heard our prayers. I'm going to bed. And at that exact moment, as this guy was pushing my dad down the hallway to the morgue, he kicked the blanket off and sat up. And this orderly wet his pants. It scared him so much. <laughs> so my dad came back from the dead, but he was always sick. He never threw a ball with me. He never did. He was always sickly. He, had, uh, he was the vice president of an insurance company, and he had to have a uh, lounge chair, and he had to take a nap every day at work. And so we never did hardly anything together. And I don't have that many memories of my dad. I knew that he loved me, and he was a great man. I've had people since then who knew him saying he was one of the most godly men that they ever knew. But I honestly don't have very many memories of my dad. The last thing I remember of my dad is right before he went into the hospital, some people came over to visit us. And for whatever reason, I was 11 at the time, and... Uh, I didn't want to meet these strangers, and so I hid in a closet. And they looked everywhere for me. And anyway, my dad was talking to the guy who was his friend, and uh, I was in the closet listening. He didn't know where I was. And he says, I don't know where he is. He's a spoiled brat. And he said, my brother, Ray, he said, now he is awesome, but Andy is just a spoiled brat. Those were the last words my dad ever said to me. And it really impressed on me when he died. I thought, man, I'm not living as I should. And that's one of the things that made me sober up and decide that I'm not going to live that way anymore. My brother, he'd take a whipping and he'd stand there and never cry. I don't care how much they whipped him. Me, my dad would just have to hit me every once in a while as I ran by because I was running and screaming and yelling and, and uh, I was a wimp. But I remember that and it sobered me up and I decided I'm not going to be that kind of person anymore. All right, well, I appreciate you all being in here. You're a blessing. Thank you so much. Amen. Let me just pray for you real quickly before I leave, okay? Father, I pray over the, all of these young people. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing them here. Thank you for their families that put enough value on you and your power in their life to bring them here. Father, we thank you for that. And we believe that this is ordered by you, that this is one of those things you had written in your book that they would be here at the Summer Family Bible Conference in 24. And Father, I pray that the things that I've shared, that what Todd has done, Josh and Shannon and everybody else who's been speaking in here, Father, we pray that you would take these words and just imprint them on people's hearts, that you would burn this, into their heart, that they would love you from a child, from a young age, that they would glorify you. And Father, we thank you in advance for as people submit and yield to what you want in their life, I thank you that this is going to save them a lot of heartache, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, and that they will fulfill what you created them for. Whatever you got written in their book, we believe it comes to pass. And I thank you for that. We agree and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What do we God say to you. Andrew? Thank you. Amen.